welcome to session four, uh, the last session for the day. And we have two excellent uh, scientists today for this session. So if you were ever at a party or a barbecue and wondered why the mosquitoes are biting you more than the other guest, then Dr. Leslie Wassell might be able to enlighten you. Dr. Wassell uh, is an HMI, HHMI investigator and professor at the Rockefeller University. She received her AB in uh, biochemistry from Columbia University in 1987 and her PhD from Rockefeller in 1993. Following her postdoctoral work at Columbia, she joined the faculty at Rockefeller in 2000. So she basically flipped between Columbia and Rockefeller. Her lab studies how complex behaviors like blood seeking and host feeding from mosquitoes are influenced by environmental cues and their own innate capacity. In addition, her lab has developed CRISPR editing tools in Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever uh, mosquito, and that will enhance our ability to screen and discover new components that regulate these behaviors. Dr. Wassell also has a very inspirational take on publishing scientific publications and the dreaded review process. Post-2015, her lab submits all their publications in bioarchive before publishing it, and they do not participate in anonymous peer review process, signing their name or sharing their review whenever permitted by the journal. Hopefully, some audience members can be inspired by that, too. And today, Dr. Wassell will share with us her recent work on understanding and modulating mosquito attraction in humans. Dr. Wassell, welcome. Thank you very much. This has been, uh, I almost don't want to give my talk. I want to ask, ask questions of all the other speakers. It was great. And I, I second Andrew's point that the best meetings are ones where it's people I've never met before doing things that I don't think about that are really stimulating me. All right. So this is my title, but this is my actual title. I, I, I was struggling to figure out how can I talk about adaptation. So I'm going to talk about how, um, how humans can adapt to this behavior. How, how can we eliminate this kind of behavior? So this is a random picture from the internet. A gentleman uh, in Florida has, uh, has treated this hand with a, a small molecule called DEET. Um, and this hand is untreated. And then uh, inserts the hand into a cage full of hungry female mosquitoes, and what's remarkable here is that uh, this thing, this chemical, which is invisible, odorless to us, is 100% effective over the course of, of this experiment. The, this gentleman will never receive a bite um, on this hand, and the, the females are happily feeding on this hand. And so this has been a puzzle for, for many, many decades. We know that this molecule works. It's a tiny, small molecule. How does it work? An incredibly interesting and important question and very controversial. If I were speaking to my peers, you guys would already be standing up and yelling and denouncing me because there's so many controversies about how it works. So this is a project um, carried out by my student, Emily Dennis, who graduated from Rockefeller yesterday. Um, and um, she did a lot of the early work in the mosquito, but um, halfway through, she saw the light and thought that, why don't I work on animals where I don't get bitten on, on a regular basis? And so we initiated a really great collaboration based on the tip from Phil Hartman at Texas Christian University uh, with my colleague, Corey Bargman, um, and two of her students and my postdoc, Laura Duval. So, okay, so what is DEET? Uh, mosquitoes present enormous public health problems, and so there's been a long push in, in, the, in the history, in the modern scientific history, to figure out ways either to kill them or to prevent them from biting us. And at, during uh, the, the years of World War II in the immediate aftermath, uh, scientists at the US uh, Department of Agriculture, funded by the Army, did a small molecule screen, basically like a, a few thousand molecules. They took them off the shelf, smeared them on the forearms and thighs of soldiers, and then put cages of, as it says here, this is the assay, forearm of each, each research subject was rubbed with one ml of the chemical to be tested exposed for three minutes in a cage containing several thousand hungry mosquitoes. So that's it's like a low throughput screen, and the assay is exactly as I showed you there. Because in the end, what they're looking for is something that humans can apply topically to the skin to protect themselves from bites. Um, and they found a number of molecules that they patented early on, but they had the extremely unfavorable uh, effect of causing basically burns and irritation on the skin. So they backed off a little bit on the chemistry and came up with DNN diethylbenzamide. Um, 
And so its chemical properties, you wouldn't immediately think that it would be the gold standard of insect repellent. So itself, to humans, has essentially no odor. And it has sort of limited volatility. So these are, these are properties that are actually helpful. You can coat your body with this stuff. And as it's sitting on your skin and, and volatilizing, it has, it has some effect on, on local arthropods in your area. So what the field can agree on is that there are broadly two mechanisms. So there's a non-volatile effect where the stuff that's smeared on your skin, when the mosquito senses it by its many sensory structures, it is repelled on contact. The volatile effect keeps them farther away. So there's, it's, it's acting on some sense um, on the olfactory system of the mosquito and other arthropods to prevent them from arriving uh, to your skin at the same time. So a couple of years ago, we started doing genetics in Aedes aegypti, the mosquito that spreads Zika, dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya. Here's my postdoc, my former postdoc, Matt DeGennaro's arm. Um, he's coated his arm with DEET here and here and has put it up against a cage. Um, let me play this unbelievably great movie once again. <laughs> All right. So arm with DEET, arm with DEET. He's put in um, either wild type mosquitoes who are staying very far away from that arm or mosquitoes where we've knocked out a major gene that's responsible for about 50% of the olfactory system of these animals. And you can see that the mutants are extremely excited to come flying over uh, to Matt's arm, suggesting that they are basically insensitive to the effects of DEET. And when we do an experiment that we can quantify, where we fly mosquitoes in a large box, and we offer them a bait of human odor in both of these channels, uh, in one case, we're hanging a filter paper that has solvent. And in another one, we hang a filter paper that has DEET. And so it's kind of like choose door A that just has human odor, choose door B that has human odor and like a hint of DEET. Um, and you can see that the wild types very, very strongly avoid the DEET. They accumulate here um, in the trap that, that does not have DEET. And the orco mutants have no idea that there's DEET. They happily disperse into both arms. So this single gene as absolutely required for that volatile repellent effect. However, when we have these mutant animals, we have this great opportunity. We can lure them to the skin, so because they don't sense it in the volatile phase. What's amazing is that um, these guys will actually land on the skin, um, but then very, very rapidly be repelled. And so um, what we can see is that the, the mutants um, are just as susceptible to DEET on the skin um, as the wild types. Um, and this is what it looks like um, in real life, that they're initially like unbelievably excited. All the wild types are avoiding the arm. Like, what are you guys doing? Here's an arm. Um, but they very rapidly uh, jump away. And so we've been really interested in what, what is this sensory modality that's mediating this? What is that contact chemo repellency? And we've been really inspired by work in Drosophila. Many people in the field have gone, including our lab, has gone back and forth. Drosophila melanogaster, the major 20th century and 21st century model organism for understanding uh, insect neurobiology and behavior uh, that has been a model for understanding repellents. And so when Craig Montel um, was here down the street at Johns Hopkins, he began to investigate what are the mechanisms of repellents use, using the fly um, as a model system, right? So fruit flies stand in for mosquitoes. And the discovery here, which is really cool, is that if he, he, he offers flies um, the opportunity to drink the eat or other insect repellents, they find it strongly aversive. So repellents taste bitter. I've actually done this experiment in my office. I've never tasted anything more bitter than DEET, right? It's an incredibly bitter substance. These experiments were important because they uh, gave the field ideas for what are the targets of DEET, how does DEET work. So knowing in Drosophila, we know essentially all of the chemosensory receptors, this will give you an idea of what is DEET acting on. So we wanted to figure out, when you move from the model of the fly to the actual animal that bites, how much of this is going to be conserved. So we repeated these experiments that the Montel lab did to ask, Flies find this stuff really bitter. I, I personally find it really bitter. 
how about mosquitoes? So if we, in this experiment, we put a bunch of um, female mosquitoes um, into a vial. We offer them, uh, they can sip from a little glass capillary that has sucrose in it or sucrose plus either of these intensely bitter substances or DEET. All of the experiments I'm about to tell you utilize the orco mutants because there's going to be DEET part of it. We need to lure them. We need to get, eliminate the um, volatile part of DEET's action. And you can see that if the capillary has no stimuli in it, all of these, these experiments, they don't care, they drink equally because they're, they're essentially equivalent. But DEET is just as hated as lobeline and, and quinine. So indeed, flies, eye, and mosquitoes find these substances intensely bitter. But so is bitter the mechanism by which DEET is repellent, right? We, we could just as well, Rather than drinking the gin and tonic, just pour the quinine on our arms and it should have the same effect. Like, is that the mechanism? Our DEET is, is bitter sensing the mechanism. And so in this experiment, when Emily put a much higher concentration of lobeline and quinine on her arm or solvent, you can see that mosquitoes will bite and blood feed, standing in a huge puddle of lobeline and quinine, suggesting that, that, that DEET, which here essentially eliminates all bites, as, as my opening slide showed, is acting through a fundamentally different mechanism than simply bitter tasting. So there's, it's acting on some other mechanism. And, um, and so that's the question. In, in Drosoph the Drosophila experiments were done um, primarily asking uh, flies to ingest DEET. And so the major thing that mosquitoes do that's different is that they um, have a proboscis that's much more complex than flies. So because the females have to puncture our skin, they have, they have this secret weapon, which is the stylet. So it's basically like a really narrow gauge syringe that when she lands on your skin, she tastes your skin with, with these little organs. Once she senses like there's something good there, she'll unsheath the syringe and then go beneath the surface of the skin um, and suck your blood. And so there's sort of these two different appendages. This senses only after she's punctured the skin um, and this is only on the surface of the skin. And so Emily did these experiments to figure out which of these two parts of the proboscis are sensing DEET. So again, is it, is it that, is it the DEET on the surface here or is it only engaged um, when uh, she's able to sample the blood? And so again, replicating these ideas that we saw on the arm, that when you smear um, DEET on the surface of this um, little device, animals are actively repelled. They will not bite through a piece of parafilm and, and get the blood. They will bite readily through quinine. But if you just have the substance actually in the blood, they're both equally repellent. So again, it just shows that in this, in this reduced environment of just, of just a piece of parafilm, that these animals are ignoring quinine, suggesting that the avoidance of bitters, which is probably involving uh, taste organs, is fundamentally different than the avoidance of DEET. Um, and so in these final experiments uh, for this part of the talk, we're just trying to figure out, okay, which sensory appendages are these animals using when they land on your skin? What I didn't mention is that insects are really weird, which is that um, on their leg appendages, they are able to sense not only touch, but also taste. So as they're walking around in the world, on surfaces, they're actually able to acquire information just on contact. They're not ingesting it, they're just touching it. Um, and so Emily did these funny experiments. Again, this is her arm with a tiny hole cut into a glove that she either coats with solvent or with DEET. Um, the animals then, the hole is so small that they aren't able to put their leg and the proboscis onto the skin at the same time. And so in this case, they don't detect the deed at all. So they happily walk over, find the tiny hole, and, and probe and bite. And so this is really nice behavioral evidence that in the process of ingestion, flies can sense that deed is bitter. But in these situations, information from proboscis is insufficient uh, to deter them from biting. And so that really implicates the legs um, in the biology. So, this conventional uh, idea that conventional taste is driving repellency cannot be correct in the mosquito. And so when she makes the hole bigger, she can see that, you know, in this instance, the animal has three legs on and three legs off. Um, and you can see that whenever uh, these animals um, have some number of legs that are contacting the DEET, um, they will not bite the human. 
And so to, to get this down to figure out, like, is it one of the legs? Is there some specialization where the forelegs are tasting the deet, the midlegs or the hind legs, and then which part of the leg is involved? Insects are just like us. They have, like, ankles and knees and thighs. So, um, so what she did is basically use um, UV curing glue to cover up, to occlude the sensory neurons that would normally be sensing tastants and other substances, and then ask, which parts of the leg are required and which legs are required to sense deep. And so in animals um, where she spared um, these, all parts of the animal, um, again, if she gives uh, the option to bite on, on solvent, they happily bite. Um, but if there's um, deep, they avoid biting. Um, if she just uh, covers the tibia, there's absolutely no effect, so they sense it. But at the moment that she treats the tarsi, which are the, the actual appendages that land on the skin, they no longer are able to sense DEET. So this is really good evidence that the actual mechanism by which these animals are sensing DEET, it's not when they're biting you, it's there, there's something like on the tips of their legs, or the tarsi. Um, and we've done a lot of extensive RNA-seq of each of the different pairs of legs to, to look for something, like what is the DEET receptor in insects? And we were hoping that it would be localized um, to one of the legs. But in fact, if she glues, um, any uh, four pairs of legs, you get a uh, strong DEET repellency from the remaining pair. So whatever the DEET receptor is, it must be located on the tarsi, on the legs, and it must be evenly distributed um, on all six legs. And so what this suggests is that DEET really, it's the ultimate multimodal repellent. Um, it affects not only the sense of smell via this olfactory receptor, co-receptor pathway, um, it's also acting by taste, just as Craig Montel originally showed. They don't like the taste of it. But this contact chemorepellency is mechanistically completely different from a bitter sensing pathway. And so I think this is the, should prompt the search for like what are the actual molecular receptors for DEET. Um, and you're going to find them um, in the legs and not in the proboscis. So how is DEET working? So it isn't just mosquitoes um, and flies. It's critters that we can buy from Carolina Biological. Um, so this is a, a plate. This is just pseudocolor blue. So this is a deep part of the plate and, an, and a control part of the plate. Um, and this little creature doesn't like it. Um, this chilipode also doesn't like it. Um, and then this really cute spider, Andrew Gordis is still here, um, will walk over to the interface, touch it, and run away. So DEET has this, and there's published work that, uh, that bees can be trained to avoid DEET, that ticks don't like DEET. So it has this, this funny molecule that was pulled off the shelf in World War II to protect humans from mosquitoes, actually has this broad selectivity across the arthropod tree of life. It's really puzzling. And so what Emily did was try to figure out, can we learn something by going further down into the evolutionary tree of life about how DEET is working? So again, the two major conflicting hypotheses about DEET in the volatile phase is that it smells really bad and repels insects, um, which I always found hard to reconcile because I can't smell it. So, um, And the other idea that we favor is that it interferes in some fundamental way with the ability of these insects to respond to odors. And so Emily turned uh, to nematodes, which unlike the other creatures, you can actually grow in the lab and do genetics with at the moment. Um, and so she, again, based on a tip from Phil Hartman, who said, I have done some initial experiments showing that DEET are that DEET repels worms. We set this up at Rockefeller using the classic hemotaxis assay pioneered by Corey Bargman uh, when she was a postdoc at MIT. And so the idea is that you put um, two patches of attractant odorant or repellent odorant, put a bunch of worms in the middle, let them disperse for an hour, um, and see where they land, this side versus this side, come up with um, a response index. And so in these kinds of experiments, we can ask, is DEET by itself a volatile repellent? So if you put a spot of DEET on each side here, if it by itself is a repellent, you should see them avoiding this spot and going over here. And in fact, under these conditions, uh, the nematodes don't care at all about DEET. They sort of assort equally as if they don't smell anything. If you put isoamyl alcohol, they love it. So you have a high chemotaxis index. Uh, most of them crawl over to the odorant. 
If you put a little spot of DEET in between the odorant splotches, they don't care. They can still sense it. Um, however, if we change up the game a little bit and put very, very low concentrations of DEET into the agarose plate where they're crawling around, now you have these really, really dramatic effects on chemotaxis. So normally, you put the worms in the middle, most of them will crawl um, toward the isoamyl alcohol. As you put progressively more and very tiny concentrations of DEET, like if you go to the store, you'll be putting 8 to 50% on your arms. These are very low concentrations. You can see there's a progressive loss of the ability of these animals to detect the odorant, which is really cool. It's doing something where their normal strong attraction to this food odor is completely abrogated. Emily now tested a number of other attractants and repellents, and here it gets even more interesting. So this is our signature odorant, isolamyl alcohol. They love it. If there's low dose of DEET in the plate, they don't sense it. Same thing for butanone, and same thing for diacetyl. So these um, attractants sense through different chemosensory neurons up here. And even this repellent, so 2 non known is really strongly repellent. In the, in, where there's DEET in the plate, they don't sense the repellent anymore. So DEET is affecting both attraction to odors and repellency from odors, but it's highly odor selective. So this odor pyrazine um, is able to overcome DEET repellency. As if, and this is a great control because it means that even though there's low doses of DEET in the plate, the animals are behaviorally normal. They can chemotax perfectly well toward pyrazine. We don't understand this, but it suggests that there's like an added level of complexity to the system. So, and this effect works across many concentrations of odorants. So even at very high concentrations of isoamyl alcohol, DEET is still able to interrupt chemotaxis. Um, and then conversely, if you go down in concentrations of pyrazine, it doesn't make any difference what dose of pyrazine. In every case, they don't sense the DEET. So it's really, there's a fundamental difference between pyrazine not being uh, able to be perturbed by DEET. So in a more naturalistic experiment, uh, we asked whether DEET can interfere with a really multi, uh, a multiple blend odorant like bacteria. So these animals feed on bacteria. Um, they find them attractive. Um, if they're asked to find them in the presence of DEET, they don't find the food. Um, if you add isomal alcohol, they still don't find the food. But if you add pyrazine, they can find the food. So again, even in, in complex odor blends, DEET is able to completely eliminate chemotaxis. So, this was the dream, like let's figure out what, what this mechanism, we have a single gene in Drosophila and in the mosquito that, that orco is required for the volatile effect. What is the genetic basis of this set of molecules able to completely eliminate chemotaxis? And so this is a great, this is the first genetic screen that I've done in 53 years of my life. Um, uh, it's really, really, it's a great gain of function screen that Emily did. So again, anim wild type animals on a plate don't approach the odorant. So she screened for animals that can now detect the odorant. And so she obtained uh, five mutants, three of which bred true, and I'll tell you about one of them. Um, and so these animals are able to chemotax toward acyl amyl alcohol in the presence of DEETs, like magical. So what is this gene? Skipping a couple of years here, but whole genome resequencing, mapping, um, Emily was able to uh, link the phenotype of these animals being resistant to the effects of DEET to a single G-protein coupled receptor called STAR217. This is in the superfamily of genes that Cori Bargman cloned when she broke open the field of, of uh, C. elegans chemotaxis. Um, and so it, it causes, it's a single uh, amino acid change here and in this uh, intracellular loop. So this, this single uh, polymorphism here is, is responsible for the phenotype. In the course of mapping it, Emily made this really interesting discovery. Normally, you, you, uh, you try to map your mutation by crossing it to this outbred Hawaiian strain. But she found, annoyingly, that the Hawaiian strain itself was resistant to DEET. So we kind of threw all those experiments out, like incredibly annoying. But then once she had cloned STAR217, she actually looked in the, Hawaiian, in the Hawaiian strain and found that it had a deletion in STAR217. And she was able to map this defect of, well, the gain of function, the, the Hawaiian guys can keep attacks in the presence of DEET. She was able to um, look in these uh, recombinant inbred strains 
and find that only those that had this little deletion were able to chemotaxis in the presence of DEET. So this natural variant is naturally DEET resistant uh, due to the effects of STAR-217. And so in these rescue experiments, she introduced a wild type copy of this G protein coupled receptor into the original mutant, which can chemotax, into, um, into uh, the Hawaiian variant, which is the natural variant that can chemotax with DEET. And then in this CRISPR-Cas9 mutant she made synthetically. In all of these cases, it rescues, meaning they now become susceptible to DEET. So they used to be able to chemotax toward odorant. She gives them the gene back, and now they cannot. So this is formal genetic evidence that this gene is um, involved in chemotaxis uh, confusion by DEET. So where is this gene expressed? So she made a promoter fusion. It's expressed in a single pair of chemosensory neurons called ADL. Here's one of them. And so that's pretty cool. We have a single G protein coupled receptor that when mutated alters the ability of DEET to affect chemotaxis. If she goes in and silences this neuron using tetanus toxin so that the neuron can no longer give information to the central nervous system, these animals are unable to respond to DEET, so they chemotax normally. So these are animals that have the STAR-217 receptor but have the neuron silence. So again, we now we have a receptor and a pair of neurons that are required to be sensitive to DEET. And so then the question is, is does this neuron respond to DEET? And so in C. elegans, uh, you can do these amazing calcium imaging experiments where you put a calcium-sensitive protein genetically encoded into these neurons, calcium is a proxy for neuronal activity. And so if ADL, if the ADL neuron is actually responding to DEET, we should be able to see an increase in fluorescence of GCAMP, which we do. So here's the worm wedged into a little channel, and we're flowing DEET across the surface. And you can see these responses, both in the wild type and in the rescue, but they're absent in the mutant. So this neuron indeed responds uh, to DEET. A previously described ligand for this neuron is a pheromone called C9. And as a way to test that we haven't just All right, I'm going to continue. Is this good? OK. So one approach to find neurons and receptors that respond to DEET would be just to, to take, a, take a wild type worm and image and find all the neurons that respond to DEET and then try to figure out why those neurons respond to DEET. This would have led us completely astray. The genetic approach was really awesome. We would have never expected ADL to be involved in this. A more conventional approach, again, would be to look at the function of other sensory neurons. Um, and so AWC um, does, is affected by DEET. And so you can see that uh, this is just the response of, um, of a cell uh, to solvent, um, and here's to an odorant, and then here's a response of the cell in the presence of DEET. You can see there's a huge uh, bump in the normal uh, basal activity um, of these cells in the presence of DEET, but these have absolutely nothing to do um, 
with the biology because these responses are identical in the, in the wild type in the STAR217 mutant. So cells can respond to DEEP but not contribute at all to the biology. Um, here's another example of another sensory neuron called ASH that shows a really strong response to DEEP. Um, but this is absolutely not biologically required because if we kill the ASH neuron, so there's a beautiful response to D. If you kill the neuron, the animals still end up being strongly sensitive to the effects of D. So the genetic approach really led us um, to this idea that there's a single gene and a single pair of neurons that mediate this. So the question arises, is STAR217 itself directly sensitive to D? When we um, take it out of the worm and put it into HEK293 cells and stimulate them, the answer is no. We find no evidence that um, in heterologous expression um, in cells that this gene uh, confers deep receptivity to, to uh, tissue culture cells. But when we do the experiment in vivo, we find a neuron that doesn't respond very strongly to DEET. Uh, this is the um, AWB neuron sitting here. So AWB shows weak responses, weak intermittent responses to DEET. When we put STAR217 in this neuron, we gain like strong responses to DEET, suggesting that not only is ADL directly responding to DEET, but STAR217 by itself is able to confer DEET sensitivity uh, to another neuron. So how is this actually working? So in looking at the direct behavior of these animals as they're crawling on the plates rather than doing the endpoint assays I talked about. The major discovery is that uh, DEET interferes with chemotaxis by increasing pausing. So if you have some food and you walk toward it quickly, you'll get there. DEET has this funny confusing effect on these animals where rather than being directed toward the odorant, they pause. So this is, a, this is a track of an animal that's a wild type animal that's crawling on a plate. The odorant is here. It makes its way very briskly here and then hangs around looking for food. In the presence of DEET, these animals spend an enormous amount of time doing really, really long pauses. And so the, the end result of this, if we look at the, at the end point of, of individual um, animals here, um, we find that um, in plates that, um, that don't have any DEET, you can see that these guys are accumulating here at the point of the odorant. If we put DEET in the plate, they end up all over the place. The STAR217 mutant, uh, we find that many of them are ending up over here with the odorant. Um, so again, this ends up increasing the probability that these animals um, are pausing. Um, and it isn't that if you give them four hours to make it to the odorant that they'll eventually get there. This, this effect on pausing is, is really chronic. So, so we, don't, uh, we don't have any effect on chemotaxis even after prolonged times. Um, and interestingly, um, this in increase in pausing is seen even if there's no odorant. So these wild type animals, if you have them walk around on a plate, they just spend a lot more time pausing. And that's eliminated in the, in the case where we have the mutant or we kill the neuron. Um, and then interestingly, pyrazine, again, this odorant that seems to cut through all of the noise of DEET, um, has absolutely no pausing effect. Um, and in the last experiment here, um, so if DEET activates ADL and ADL injects a pausing signal into the circuit, we should be able to um, inhibit chemotaxis by, um, by increasing pausing. And so optogenetic activation um, of ADL with channel rhodopsin variant shows that um, animals that are exposed to light where we've activated ADL show this huge increase um, in pausing. So how does this work? So the way we think about this problem is that um, ADL is injecting uh, via DEET um, some sort of a noise signal um, into the system. So DEET is activating ADL that requires STAR217. And what's pretty cool is that the odorants are actually sensed by this neuron. So the odorants are activating this sensory neuron, but are somehow paying attention to signals um, from this neuron. Um, and this is also, an ADL is also affecting um, the reception of this 2 known known repellent um, and butanone and diacetyl, um, but is not affecting um, the, the reception of pyrazine. And so the way that we think about this is that, again, these odorants would normally encode repellency and attraction. Indeed, is altering the expected output by, by scrambling 
uh, the sensory system. And the way we think about the way I've been thinking about it is that if you're normally thinking about this like really adorable Mozart piece, this is what this is what the, the worm would be seeing without the that that the mosquito um, or the worm smelling um, smelling these substances in the presence of deed, everything gets all garbled up and it ends up being like mid-century modern music. And so we think that um, now, Emily's analogy, she has like a pizza and a pizza cover with garbage, right? So that, so this is, this is my music analogy. And so we think that this is, it's, it's imp we think it's impossible to come up with like a single molecular mechanism that's going to work from that, that spider and like the centipede and C. elegans and tick and honeybee and moth and fly um, and mosquito that's going to account for a unified mechanism. And so the, our current guiding hypothesis is that deep, somehow miraculously is, is acting in a multimodal way on taste and on touch. And then the olfactory system, it scrambles the relationship between input and output um, with a variety of different molecular targets in these species. And so I want to thank the very people who worked on this and you for listening. Oh, that was very interesting. So uh, I always would have thought of DEET as a repellent before, but you're calling it a confusant. But you also studied another repellent, known and known. So uh, I take it that known and known is definitely not a confusant. Can you say that? Or, yeah, what? what's the, how do you distinguish between those? I know, yes. Yeah, so the, so... We were really surprised by the by the result that that um, that DEET can confuse the perception of a repellent. So no, known and known is a is a is a canonical volatile repellent that 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 triggers a, an aversion response. DEET doesn't seem to be doing that. So, um, and and I think that that's consistent with everything that we've done in the in the fly or the or the, or the mosquito. As long as you don't let the animals touch. The D, it's really it's really acting to scramble how how those things are are perceived. Um, what what does ADL normally sense, and does it cause the same kind of confusing effects? So, as it were, ADL is a really confusing neuron. So ADL ADL does uh, uh, respond to this pheromone uh, C nine. It's like one of the least studied uh, sensory neurons uh, in C elegans. It seems to play this general role as, as a modulator of other sensory input, which is kind of cool. You get this random, very small polar molecule seems to be hooking into, um, into this neuron channel that actually was sort of built to confuse and modulate. You can see how promiscuous it is. It's also activating um, AWC. It's also activating um, ASH. Um, and those things seem to be sort of incidental to the, to the main phenotype. But so it's like a really, it's the dirtiest possible drug you could imagine, and it's able to to like to mess with the minds of all these different arthropods. Are are there any uh, G protein coupled receptors in mammals that are related to this two ninety seven or whatever it yeah. was? And. Is, it any, is there any relationship between confusion and the bitter taste reaction? So we don't think so. So, so Craig, um, so STAR217 is a, is a canonical class A G protein coupled receptor. It does have, doesn't have any direct orthologs out, outside of nematodes, but it has cousins and relatives all the way, all the way up to, to humans. Um, so... Um, so we don't think that the, you have to, I, we had graduation last night and I'm like so tired. I had like so much wine last night. You have to repeat your question. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. So, so in fact, DEET is such a dirty molecule that it has, um, it has a potent effect on like on human uh, trip channels and human, human non-selective cation channels are like potently agonized. By D. Um, based on my own psychophysical experiments, I would bet that the T2R bitter receptors that I have in my tongue are being like crazy activated by D. I don't know why D does not seem to in interfere with our olfactory perception of cues. And so I'm it is a puzzle because the odorant receptors that, that you have 
are sort of vaguely in, in the same class as star 217. But it just seems to be like there is no one size fit, fits all mo model for these things. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we did get we, we got we got another gene that's that's a, like a, a sugar anti porter that's um, and I, I would love to go back and do more right now not once you've done now that I've done genetics look pretty exciting <laughs> you can find stuff out. Pyrazine seems to be kind of a issue with the with the experiment. Do you think it's acting in like a slightly different pathway than than the one containing DEET because it seems to be avoiding the DEET altogether? What, yeah. I think it's I think it's a good issue. It was a good issue. For, it's puzzling. It's a good issue because it because um, I think my number one concern with with doing these experiments is that is that DEET would just act as a paralytic. Like you know you could have like an increase in pause and it could just be that it's a non-specific paralytic. So I love the fact that you can put DEET on the plate and they happily crawl toward pyrazine. What's the the mechanism? I think that it, it's going to come down to this. Wiring diagram that um, that AWA seems to be less connected or largely disconnected from from the ability of ADL to to play with it. So so we think it's just again this molecule is a completely synthetic molecule. Um, worms did not evolve to sense it, and so this this is our best interpretation is that ADL is able to interfere with sensory biology on this arm. Um, and pyrazine is sort of resistant to it because it's able to send the sensory information through, through a redundant pathway. Uh, so um, DEET is also pretty toxic, toxic to, to human beings. I mean, one should tr use it, but not often, and one should be careful. I mean, I taste it as well. It's very bitter. Uh, so since you now have fed some of the DEET to some animals, right, they, right, could you, have you started seeing some other effects rather than just the, like, you know, internalizing it and, mm -hmm. and finding out where the toxicity could yeah. come from? So, so I want to correct, I want to um, push back again. So DEET is not, it's at least the EPA under previous administrations yes. that actually oh, registered yeah. chemicals. Um, it's, it's been renewed since, I think yeah. it was, it was, a, it was a, in the U.S., it's like a consumer product since 1950. And we put huge... You put between like 200 millimolar and one molar on your yeah. skin. So yeah. the dosing is really, really intense. There's really only really incidental reports of people being poisoned by it. So mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's pretty safe. Mm -hmm. The question of whether, however, it, it does act on non-selective uh, cation channels. So I think like, you know, if we, if, if we made them, if we fed them, um, uh, you know, E. coli and, and DEET for a bunch of generations, I bet we would start to see phenotypes similar to the, to the great talk that we heard. But I haven't done it. I have one too. Can I can I ask one more? So <laughs> so um so since in the sixty years or so that people have been using DEET against mosquitoes, is there evidence that the mosquitoes are becoming resistant to DEET? And can you use sort of the same logic of finding what are the variants in the mosquitoes that are potentially? Yep. Um, so there are a couple of reports of, of Aedes aegypti that you can, in, in the laboratory, that you can, you can select for resistance. The group that did that was not able to, um, was not able to map that um, to a locus. We now have a much better genome for Aedes aegypti, so it's possible it could be, could be mapped. My feeling is that in natural populations, DEET is such a nasty product that it has not been used as intensively as insecticides have, have like a proximal effect on populations. They contact it, they die. D, we would have to we'd have to do a huge campaign where everybody would have to religiously apply one molar D for a couple of years to see if there's resistance. So we we just haven't run the experiment because it's such a terrible product because it's so greasy and and nasty. <laughs>